if we think that just because we've done something, an Earth Day took place and we planted our tree, or we recycled twice, that we've done our share, we are uh, laughing ourselves down a path of disaster. So what I'm going to do this evening is probably bum you out. Um, I'm going to talk about tropical forests, but, but the thing that's a problem is that I'm sorry to say that I do not have a grand plan to save tropical forests. We involve ourselves at the Rainforest Alliance in seeking and developing alternatives to deforestation. And as you'll see, it's a messy, messy business. And there is no single solution to tropical deforestation. And the next time, and I'll talk about this, somebody says, save the rainforest, and they tell you how, don't believe them because I don't think there is one way. So, if I could have the lights, I'm going to give you a general slideshow and then talking about uh, the problems and what, where they are, what's happening to them, what we can do to get involved, and then take questions and uh, see what happens. You know, I wonder if somebody's going to have to actually turn the slide projector on. Okay. Is that in focus? So as I said, this evening I'll talk about the past, the present, and the future of tropical forests, what they are, where they are, what's happening to them, and what they provide us, and how we can help out. I would hope to leave you with five main points. The first is, which that, is that tropical forests are the greatest celebration of life on Earth more complex than we may ever be able to discover. In fact, I would probably still wager that we know more about the face of the moon than we know about the upper canopy of a dense tropical forest. Tropical forests are being destroyed very quickly. For many, many reasons, over 100 acres of tropical forests are being destroyed every single minute an area the size of the eastern seaboard every year, or something like twice the size of New York State. Forty percent, conservatively, of the total area is already gone. If great action is not taken in this and the next decade, our children will probably remember tropical forest as things that used to be. This is our concern about the fears of the future of tropical forests. The reasons for deforestation, as I said, are terribly complex, and are no, there are no simple solutions. We may say, save the rainforest to catch your attention, but it's really important to remember that the problems in each tropical forest region, community, neighborhood are just as diverse as the problems in, say, in New York of Crown Heights and Queens and parts of Queens. You know, we all have our different problems. And just because we say save the rainforest to catch your attention, it's actually wrong. It's a generalization that we shouldn't make. What we can say, however, is that everybody's hands are on the chainsaw, including yours and mine. There are things that we can all do to help save endangered tropical forests, but we must first recognize how interdependent we are with them and how we can act as better stewards for their survival. I think if we don't realize this, everything we do will be overkill. Tropical rainforests cannot just be saved by money, as I mentioned earlier, but by, with care and thought and timing and with money. First of all, where are they? Tropical forests are found between 5 degrees north and 5 degrees south of the equator, and they act like a green girdle. The forests can be found in over 50 countries, but just three of them, Brazil, Indonesia, and Zaire, contain over half the total area. Brazil by far has the most. The United States has rainforests in Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Trust Territories, but it makes up a very, very small percentage. 
While the forests are lush and teeming with life, in most places the soils are thin with nutrients and the vegetation has very little root system to work with underground. Unlike our temperate soils, tropical farming is very, very difficult and leaving most with the feeling that the forest is best left wild. It usually dies before giving way to sustained agriculture. And even today, there are very few products, if any, that can make it in a world market that came from a rainforest that was not destroyed. However, the standing forests are extremely diverse. This is the thing that usually blows me away the most about the rainforest, and that's up to 85%, perhaps as many as 90, of all the world's living species can be found there. Imagine that. Think about the equator, or think, and think about a little girdle going around it, 2% uh, of the Earth's surface, very, very small percentage, make it up 90% of the world's species. Unfortunately, however, a species an hour is being lost to extinction. Or, if you go by the words of Dr. E.O. Wilson of Harvard University in last week's New York Times, he says up to four species an hour are being lost to extinction. Here's some examples of the, the, the biodiversity of a tropical forest. You can go ahead and yell out your wildlife knowledge if you know what these are. This is definitely a bird. <laughs> but what kind of bird? This is a trogon. This trogon is from tiny Costa Rica. If you look at a map, you see Costa Rica is very, very small. However, it has more species of birds than in all of North America, including Canada. Many of those birds migrate to the United States. And if you notice a lack of songbirds or warblers, uh, many people say it's because it's a lack and loss of, of tropical forest. Okay, these are, let's try it, leaf cutter ants, which along with termites are the decomposers of the forest. They recycle plant nutrients with a phenomenal efficiency rate of close to 100%. So this makes the competition for life and death in tropical forests very, very intense. And leafcutter ants are really great to watch, but you got to watch out as well because they are uh, they're one they have one track minds. One time I was walking in a path in French Guiana, and any time you walk in a rainforest, anyway, it's not something to take for granted. You have to be careful in a rainforest. You follow the path, and I was following the path, and I you know was sort of looking up and looking at everything, trying not to touch anything because you don't want to touch anything because you don't know what it is, and a lot of the things will give you strange sort of rashes and things you don't want ever. <laughs> and I was walking along and I, and I was just following the trail and all of a sudden I didn't really know if I was on the trail anymore and you know when you walk in a rainforest you realize how minuscule you really are in comparison to everything else. It's almost like a, like a church or something. And I thought I was lost and was starting to get very, very panicky and, but this was the trail, and I looked down and I realized, I realized two things. One, I realized there were hundreds of leafcutter ants climbing up my pants. <laughs> and I didn't like that. <laughs> so I shook them off, and I, what I realized was I had taken a turn where the leafcutter ants had cleared an entire pathway from ground to about 10 feet high, everything, for about 15, 20 feet. And I gotta tell you, I have a lot of respect for those ants. They work, they work very, very hard and are very efficient at what they do. Anyway, these are, or this is, an orangutan. This is a morpho butterfly, the spirit of the forest. Anybody know what these are? These are kinkajous, otherwise known as honey bears. I think they're pretty cute. However, these aren't. <laughs> these are capybaras. Now, many people claim that capybaras are the world's largest rodent. However, in the subways of New York, <laughs> there are some rats that I think come very, very close to this. This is sort of out of focus and because 
I was uh, I took this shot just a few months ago in Costa Rica in the cloud forest, and I was out of focus because I was a little nervous. I didn't want to get too close to this tarantula, which was uh, far bigger and meatier than my hand. I'm making rainforests sound very appealing, am I not? <laughs> These are heliconias. The number of a plant species in a rich 10 acres of rainforest can exceed that of many temperate forest countries. Heliconias often grow in secondary growth, areas that have been cut down once before, where they let light in. And these, these things are really beautiful, and they grow everywhere. And in New York, you pay three, four dollars a stem for these things. And we can't forget the frogs. This frog uh, was another little experience in French Guiana. This is a yellow and black dendrobate. You do not want to touch the frog. Repeat after me. Do not touch the frog. The frog has got... Uh, uh, chemicals in it that will make you very uncomfortable. The red-eyed tree frog, much more cute. You can touch the frog. <laughs> Rainforests typically receive about 160 inches of rain every year, which is five times that of New York. And they have mild seasonal variations, but they do have fruiting and flowering seasons, just like their temperate forests. However, we think of a rainforest that doesn't have a pronounced climate change, but in fact, they do. Most of the sunlight in the forest hits the top of the trees and makes them overflow with light. The floor of the forest, however, gets much less light and rain, and it makes them very easy to walk through. And that's what I said before, you know, you, you're walking through the forest and it doesn't look like this Tarzan and Jane jungle vine sort of thing where you have to bushwhack all the time. If it's a beautiful primary forest, it can be very easy to walk through, consequently very easy to get lost in. People have been walking through these forests for thousands of years. Many of them are native peoples who know the forest as their first and only home. Sadly, however, the peoples, plants, and animals living in tropical forests are endangered because of the reasons I'll soon discuss. Is it too late for the peoples of the forest? Well, in the 1500s, there were an estimated 6 to 8 million Indians in the Amazon. Today, there were less than 200,000. I mean, if I was on, a, on, a, on almost every day, I'll tell you that I don't think the Indians, the way that they've lived, keeping their cultures, have a real long-term chance of survival. We don't know how to deal or work with people who have different cultures than our own. Do we put a fence around them and make them be like they're in a zoo? Or do we try and put our clothes and cultures into them? Uh, it's a very difficult situation. What we, what we should do is let them decide for themselves. However, we don't often allow that to happen. As I mentioned, the reasons for deforestation are terribly complex. And I will keep repeating that because I want to drive that point home. I can say, however, that it all usually starts with a road, sometimes funded by our own ta tax dollars. Once a road is built, the forest is fair game for people to enter. And sure enough, we did the same thing in the United States. You build a road, you go there. Or you pave the way, you go there, and then a road is built because there's a reason to get where you want to go. And this has been taking place for a long, long time. This is going to show you a series of slides of showing the Atlantic Coast Forest in Brazil. And you can see when people started to move in, people started to live in these forests. Now the, for the slide on the left is 1500, and the black area represents the primary forest regions, the forest regions, uh, its vegetation. In that time, 1500, 81.8% was forested. And this is, by the way, uh, has been over time one of the most diverse, it's not the Amazon, but it's on the Atlantic coast of Brazil, one of the most diverse areas in the world. And on the right, 1845, we go down to 79.7%. In 1907, 58%. Notice the white dots. These are communities moving in. These are roads being built. These are shops being put up. These are cities starting. In 1952, there's a lot more white than there is black, 18.2%. And reality hits home. In 1973, 8.3 was left. In the year 2000, it is projected and probably will remain 3%, maybe 2%. And of that, if you read the papers last year, you would find that in this tiny percentage of forest that's left over, a new species of primate was found. 
I mean, you think that you'd seen everything. This is such a small amount, and yet in this small area, we find new things. But this is the future of tropical forests all around the world. Uh, large land masses with green vegetation and lots of biodiversity that are basically shrinking into the no nothing. Back to roads. They open up the forest to an influx of urban and rural poor and displaced farmers who tend to slash and burn areas to get that thin layer of nutrients and then move on after a few years when the soils have given out. This represents about 50% of deforestation. And I have two things to say about that. One is that uh, it's true that you, know, you look at your temperate tr forest trees, the trees here in, in the Midwest, and the, and the roots go way down deep. If you look at, when you look at slides of the rainforest, you see the buttresses of the trees go out uh, laterally because in most areas in the tropics, not all of them, but in most areas, you, you kick away the leaf litter, which are the nutrients, and you pick up what's below it, and it's like clay. And you think, how could anything grow there? Well, it's tough. Not much does grow there. It's green and lush, and it's a paradise, but it's a counterfeit paradise. However, people who are being forced out of cities, people who have no jobs, no homes, but have, have a family to feed, are desperate, and they're looking for a way to make ends meet. And when I say make it and find a way to make ends meet, that means often having a couple of meals a day and a roof over their head. And I ask you, or you can ask me, if I was faced in a situation, put in a situation where, uh, where I was trying to get cut down a tree for fuel wood, or to, to try and grow a crop for a year to feed my family and some big time environmentalist from New York comes up and says, yo, you can't be doing that. You know, this is bad for the environment, I would say. I'm sorry, but my family comes first. And this is the dilemma that we have to realize. And we can't be making accusations about how it's their fault. You know, we all have our hands on the chainsaw, as I said. And it's a very complicated situation. And you can't just buy something or not buy something and think that you're gonna solve the problems of these people. It's not going to happen. But, as a result, there are big problems. This Landstat photo shows the state of Rondonia in 1987, September. And, I'll go over here for a second. These big plumes, which look like clouds, are not clouds, but they're fires. And on that day, on that day, in 1987, there are approximately 2,500 fires burning. That is a lot of burning. I was reminded how much burning that was when uh, the Kayapo Indian chief, Rayoni, came to the United States a while back with the rock star Sting, who has taken the rainforest as his, one of his causes. And we sat at a lunch, and Rayoni said that uh, the fires and the clouds and the smoke was so bad that in my village we could not see the sun for three weeks. And he was mad, and he said, what are you white people doing? And by white, he meant non-Indians, the Portuguese, anybody who's not an Indian. And I, you know, I had no answers for him. I don't think we have any answers for him. In Central America, the chief cause of deforestation is ranching for cattle, where it takes approximately one hectare to feed one cow. This, if you're doing your calculations now, is not a good land-to-cow ratio. However, this again is a very complicated situation. People, there was a big boycott of Burger King and fast food hamburger chains in the United States a few years ago because Burger King said they bought beef from Costa Rica. Now, Costa Rica is an interesting case because they have more national park, more protected areas than almost any other country, but they're also lo losing their tropical forests faster than any other country. And literally, what is not protected in Costa Rica in five years is gone. That's the limit. There will be no more rainforest if it, outside of that has, that has been protected. However, at the time when there was boycotts going on of, of the beef situation and, 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 you know, don't eat beef, boycott Burger King, well, that's fine. I think it raised a lot of awareness, and frankly, I don't think beef is you know, great for the land or your or bodies, anyhow. Um, but you know, that's people's decision. 
What I don't think was right was that Costa Rica had a fragile economy and was trying to come up with ways to do conservation. And Westerners decided that, we, that it was bad. What they were doing was bad. Now, a little history. In the 1960s, it was the United States that said, if you guys ra grow cat raise cattle down here, we'll buy it from you because it's going to be cheaper, leaner beef. And they did. So Costa Ricans changed their economy over. And then, just like a heroin addict, they were cut off with no alternative. Well, I think, well, once again, to reiterate, I think cattle is bad for the land, and bad for rainforest. I've driven for hours and hours and hours in Costa Rica and Panama and seen nothing but land like this that is just deforested. If we're going to work for conservation, we have to work for alternatives. And I think, once again, that's a difficult thing to do. As I was saying, driving for hours and hours. This particular shot is Puerto Bello National Park in Panama. There are many national parks in Panama. This happens to be the only federally protected national park. I don't think it's working. The main cause of deforestation in Southeast Asia and becoming more and more popular in the Americas is commercial logging. The Rainforest Alliance has begun a certification program where we audit sources and companies who believe their woods are derived from well-managed forest areas. Unfortunately, however, we know that 99% of the current commercial forestry practices are destructive, leaving log areas seriously degraded while taking only the choice trees. Overall, the United States imports $2 billion a year in timber following Japan and Western Europe in, quantity, in the amount of quantity. Timber is another tough question because do you just not buy tropical hardwoods? But is that an alternative? For people in Indonesia, who, and some of them have been uh, doing plantations or using a good system of logging for hundreds of years, but that's such a small percentage. What is the alternative? How can we help them work with this problem and come up with a better way? These are the questions that are facing us. This uh, is the Amazon River superimposed on a map in the United States. Pretty amazing. This is the most amazing thing also outside of the biodiversity for me. Now, the point I'll make here is that all countries want to exploit their natural resources. Goodness knows we've done it in the United States. And in Brazil, they have the mighty Amazon River. The Amazon River is 4,000 miles long. It has 17 tributaries more than 1,000 miles and over 10 that are larger than the Mississippi River. At its mouth, the Amazon is 200 miles wide and over 100 feet deep. Imagine that if you can. It discharges 7 million cubic feet per second into the Atlantic Ocean, enough to fill Lake Ontario in three hours. It has more species of fish than the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, I think that's, wow, that's, that's very impressive. <laughs> Name another river that can do that. So with all this water, it's no wonder that the Brazilian government sees dams, hydroelectric power, as its major energy source. Unfortunately, dams in Brazil have often been built with poor planning, flooding thousands of miles of forest, inundating hundreds of millions of dollars, a dollar's worth of timber, and forcing the death and relocation of animals in Indian villages. Brazil has already built four giant dams in the last 10 years and has proposed an additional 80 for the future. Once again, these dams are often funded with our tax dollars. And once again, I am not against hydroelectric power. I think it can be a good source of energy. However, I am against uh, unwise planning and wastes of money. And I think that when you build something like this and, and it's going to have, you have to look at the side effects for many, many years to come and the materials that it will be built with. So like other dams in the Amazon, they don't rust after five or ten years and become completely inoperable. <coughs> there are many problems in the Amazon. One you probably read about is gold mining. In the Amazon Basin, we are witnessing one of the greatest gold rushes ever. Since 1979, over 800,000 independent gold miners 
have been penetrating remote forest areas and subjecting sensitive river, river regions to siltation and, worst of all, mercury poisoning. And if anybody remembers Minimata, Minimata, the, the mercury spill in, in Japan and the deformities that came as a result of that, they can only look with fear and uh, trepidation about what's going to happen in Brazil and Peru and Colombia, where mercury is still being used. These miners here are panning for gold uh, in, in near Porto Maldonado in Peru. And they don't usually strike it rich. This becomes a life for them. And they get enough gold usually to make a living, but not strike it rich. Although they, they dream of that, just like when we buy a lottery ticket. These threats, along with and caused by economic stagnation, overpopulation, unstable governments, military regimes, or anxious militaries, are putting an intense stress on tropical forests. In selfish terms, as the forest is shrinking, we are losing the world's greatest gene bank, which has given us many of the products we now take for granted, and may save us from future flights or food shortage, sort, ooh, shortages. I would bet that each of you has, a, has used at least half a dozen products since you woke up this morning. In fact, I would bet that you used half a dozen products in your first waking hour. If you had cornflakes, had a banana, had coffee, used a hardwood table, brushed your teeth, used deodorant, there are hundreds of products that have their origin in the tropical forest. However, most of them are either synthesized or turn the forest into something that is no longer a forest. Here's just a few of the food items. Believe me, if we had to take away all the products that we ever got from a tropical forest, we would be very, very bored with our diet. It would be something like uh, sunflower seeds uh, and some meat. <laughs> we, we enjoy the tropical forest. And there's a lot of other things we enjoy from the forest. Does anybody know what this is? Any wild guesses? This is chiclet, chewing gum in its raw form. It was when I saw this slide that I stopped chewing gum. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> this particular batch is processed raw like this and going to be shipped off to France and it's going to be ch cut into little pieces like the chiclets. And I, would, I don't know how many of you chew gum out there. <laughs> But it looks pretty good to me, huh? Okay, what are these two items? What's that laughing? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> on the left, we have the birth control pill. And on the right, we have sweet potato. Make the connection. <laughs> it was a derivative of a wild yam, a cousin of the sweet potato that was found in a Mexican forest about to be bulldozed that revolutionized birth control. Because with, without diostenin, the alkaloid derived from the yam, there possibly still may be no oral contraceptives available today. In fact, many prescription drugs have their origins in tropical forests. The medicines shown here are derived from curare. It's a potent muscle relaxer used by Indians as a poison. Without curare, much of modern surgery would not be possible. And what scientists found looking at the way native peoples used plants was that the difference between a poison and a cure was often just a matter of dosage. One of my favorites. This is the rosy periwinkle. You may have it in your backyard. It grows everywhere now. The rosy periwinkle is from Madagascar. In the 1960s, if you or anyone you knew had Hodgkin's disease or childhood leukemia, their chances of survival were slim, one in five. However, in the 1960s, they were looking for, looking at the alkaloids from this plant, and they found that it killed white blood cells. They were actually looking for diabetes, but they found out that it was good for treating cancer. 
Now, as a consequence of these two alkaloids, vincristine and vinblastine, your chances of surviving childhood leukemia and Hodgkin's disease are four in five. Madagascar, the country of origin of this plant, never received a penny. And they're not happy about it. Tragically, with the loss of forests, extinction and acculturation of tribal peoples has been rampant. I talk about all the things that we got from the forest. Our invaluable knowledge of native plants with the enormous potential for agriculture and medicine and industry and tasty foods. We're losing all that. These people are losing their home. Their one and only home. Tropical forests also help us and them regulate the global climate. In addition to their complex interactions with the atmosphere and the oceans, the burning of large tracts of tropical forests receive large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, contributing to the warming of the Earth's surface. You've read about it, you've heard about it. I have actually seen, well this will be a good story. I have actually seen a video that showed uh, cloud cover in, in Brazil that carried itself, the clouds, through NASA and Landsat imagery showing the clouds carrying themselves all the way to Kansas. So this is a scientist who was trying to tell me that you, know, you cut down the forest in Brazil and you lose the trees, you lose the rainfall there. You lose the clouds, you lose the rainfall here. What have you been saying about no rain here? Aha. Well, it's it you know it may be true. We cannot, we're not exactly sure what the what the interactions are and the and the connections. But how many times has your weather person been able to predict the weather right two days in a row? And everybody wants specific proof that we're having global warming or that our climate is changing 50 years from now, and we want to wait until we have concrete proof until we make those changes. Well. Oh boy, prevention is a, is a good cure. So in addition to their complex intera interactions with the atmosphere, you're gonna, you can see the burnings of the forest. And what we're afraid of, and what artists rendition, is that places like Manhattan, Manhattan, New York, could be underwater in 50 years. And if you own seafront property, you may want to consider selling it. Same thing in Florida. Because it's possible that with the warming of the climate, melting of polar ice caps, we could in fact have a rising of the ocean, which could in fact uh, have serious consequences. This artist's rendition is King Kong swimming up Columbus Avenue. When the forest protective cover is gone, not only do we have a lot of all the other things that I mentioned, but exposed land is subject to both flooding and drought. The former forest becomes a wasteland, the results of which can be catastrophic for the people and wildlife surrounding the affected areas. There is one last argument for protecting tropical forest. And I believe it's the real reason of the Rainforest Alliance and a lot of other people and that is because tropical forests have a right to exist for their own sake and for the sake of all the life that lives within them. Scenes from the year 2000. The last elephant hides in the last rainforest. We hope that this is never the case. However, we can't just sit idly back, idly by, and, and hope that it's never the case. There are things that we can do to get involved. And they range. There are a lot of different things that you can do. This photo slide here is from the Daintree Rainforest in Australia, where people uh, were blockading a road. They didn't want loggers in there anymore. That's one way that people try and get themselves involved. Another way is to support people's who live in the forest, who are native to the forest. The Rainforest Alliance works with a group called Ametra in Peru, which is trying to combine traditional and Western medicines and do conservation at the same time. 
One of their big projects is with this tree called Ohe. They are building an ethnobotanical center and they're trying to plant this Ohe tree along the riverbanks, intercrop with fruit trees because Ohe is tapped like rubber and it gives this sap that is used in treating ch childhood diarrhea, which is one of the major causes of death in the tropics. And they're figuring out how to use this, how to replant the trees. We can support science. This slide here is of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Center in Panama, and they have built this huge crane. It's really big. To get above the canopy of the rainforest, and they can, they can stay in there, and they can lower themselves down to do studies of the rainforest. My problem with it, however, they're doing it now because they want to be able to know how to regrow a forest when all of them are gone. Well, that's great, but I'd rather, I mean, if you've got to do something, I think, you know, maybe we can look, look at uh, what we can do to still keep the ones standing that are still there. Applied research and scientific research, it's all very necessary, and we need a lot more of it. If you're looking for a field to go into, this would be a good one. Here's another Smithsonian research project. This is the minimum critical size of ecosystems in Brazil. What we've done here is they have taken uh, plots of land, 1, 10, 100, and 1,000 hectares in size, and they've cut areas around them. They've actually done the deforestation around them. And what they want to find out is, what is the minimum critical size that a, a, a system, a species, is going to need to survive? And thus far, the results are not too surprising. The larger the land, the more likely a chance a species will survive. We can support ethnobotanists and native peoples, as I said, who are working in the forest. This is Mark Plotkin of Conservation International in Washington. He and other ethnobotanists go down and try and study and learn from and work with peoples who know the forest. Because as a species goes, that's one thing, but every time a shaman dies, someone who knows the plants of the forest dies, it's as if we're burning libraries and there are no other copies of the books. And with acculturation, younger people in villages aren't very interested in learning the traditional ways and how to use medicinal plants. And there are alternatives that we need to look at. These are, uh, well this is me and two friends in Peru. One of them is wearing a Brazil nut. And this is, we're standing behind a Brazil nut tree. And if you've eaten Ben and Jerry's Rainforest Crunch or uh, ice cream or uh, the candy that they make now, it's made with Brazil nuts. So trying to show that there are products that can come out of the rainforest in a sustainable way that will not destroy the forest. And you're going to see a slew of products. You're even going to see a cereal from a major cereal company in the spring. And there's a cookie. And there are toggle buttons that are made from nuts in uh, Ecuador. Trying to, they're like ivory substitutes. And another, just another thing about Brazil nuts is Every Brazil nut you've ever eaten was picked by hand. Every single one of them. And it is a nasty job. What they do is in the rainy season, they go out and, you know, in the rainforest, there's so many different species, you may not find a Brazil nut every couple hundred yards or quarter mile. It could be a long hike. And it's wet and it's rainy. And there's a lot of snakes out this time of year. And you go and you got to, have these people, they have big 50 pound sacks and they put all the the Brazil nuts fall down and they have a machete and they hack them open and they take the nuts out and they stick them in the bag and they leave the shells, which these are, and they go into the next tree. And believe it or not, many, many people die every year from those filled Brazil nuts falling on their head. You laugh, but it's true. These things are heavy. I could not think of a, a more difficult job. And then most of the time in the dry season they're tapping for rubber. So we have a romantic views of rubber tappers and Brazil nut collectors, but whew, boy. But we need to be aware of these alternative products because these are things that we can look to and ask for. Smart wood. The Rainforest Alliance has a certification program where we will go down and look at, at logging areas and based upon recommendations that we have that are based on many, many people's inputs, we will certify a source. So then if a company sells only those tropical woods from that source, 
that we allow them to use this logo. So companies like Smith & Hawken or Plow & Hearth, catalog companies that you may have seen, and more and more in the future, as hopefully there'll be more and more supply available, you can look for this logo. And you can also ask next time, or at least think, the next time you're going to buy a stereo or, or a teak salad bowl, or a, a, for that matter, a teak coffin, uh, find out what kind of wood it is. And, and ask, and find out if you really need that sort of wood, and see if there are alternatives, or see if, see if you're, the retailer knows, or if their supplier knows. Here's something I know you're going to be interested in. Here's a new snack treat. This is the iguana. There are several experimental sites going on in Central America right now to raise iguana for edible meat. Why? An iguana eats less food in three years than a chicken in four months. It feeds on the top of the tree, so it does not need land, like cattle. It's rich in protein, and I hear it doesn't taste half bad. <laughs> Somewhat like that chicken you recently had. We need to be creative when we're looking for alternatives to deforestation. We need to be uh, flexible to how we live, and to how other peoples live. Because we're in a desperate situation, and we need creative possibilities, like raising iguanas for meat. And it also keeps them alive in the wild. And there are simple things that we can do, like not buying endangered wildlife species. If you're not sure, ask. Uh, it's an easy thing to do alligator shoes. You know, the World Wildlife Fund has a CITES program. They will send you, uh, 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 let, the, let the buyer beware, it's a brochure on endangered wildlife species. Get a hold of it. Do a little homework. Be a good shopper. The onus is on us. We have to practice what we preach. Yo amigo, we need that tree to protect us from the greenhouse effect. Like I mentioned earlier, we can't really tell other people to conserve their forests if we are not going to try to do what we can ourselves, if we are not going to make wise investments in our own future or in our child's future. Uh-oh, this is the slide that I put in backwards. Well, this slide talks about perception of how far one is from the forest and how far one is from the city to what the perceptions of how bad the problem is. I'll skip over that one. Because it talks about what we need to do, once again, to make sure that we are going to be doing a good job at home. I heard the person who made the introductions this evening talk about the brochures, and she's absolutely right. That was a great statement. You know, if you're going to go home and throw it away, don't take it at all. Read it and put it back. Read it and give it to somebody else. If you're not recycling, recycle. These are simple things. And if, there's, if there was one thing that I would urge you to leave here with this evening, and that is, we have busy lives. We are busy people. We live by a watch or a clock. Time sets its in motion, and we barely have enough time to sleep. If you can find one little thing in your life to make happen every single day, sort of like flossing, you know? You didn't want to do it, but you just take a minute, you do it every single day, you realize it's a part of your life, and it's not so bad. You find one thing that you can do for the environment that you're not doing now, and make it a part of your life. And you'll realize, a few weeks later, or a few months later, if you're doing it, that it wasn't such a big deal after all, after all. And that, in fact, you can take on something else, and then you, in fact, in fact, can make a difference. The only thing that stops us from not making a difference is the fact that we don't even try. One time, a few years ago, an architect walked into my office and he said, I know that we use tropical hardwoods in our design, but I don't know what to do about it. And we sat down, and we wrote a resolution to the American Institute of Architects about doing a study of what woods that they use. And later that year, it passed unanimously in front of hundreds and thousands of architects. 
And now, the AIA, the American Institutes of Architects, has a big task force on rainforest, task force, and they, and they, almost every architect knows something about their involvement of the species that they use for tropical forests. And I would argue that one person made that happen. One person who didn't even know what he was trying to do. He just cared and made an effort. Sorry, I don't want to preach, but it's true. This works. Trust me. The World Bank. Multilateral development banks. Funded 30% for U.S. tax dollars. They have done a lot of bad things in the past. They have funded a lot of bad roads. Bad development projects. Development at development's sake is not good development. Development without destruction is what we're looking for. However, the World Bank, up until a few years ago, didn't have any environmentalists on staff. They, if you sent in a good proposal from a developing country, you could probably get the money. It caused a lot of negative impacts on the environment, and I'm still very unhappy with them. And they have a AAA stock rating. So even now, you have to monitor the World Bank, and a lot of groups in Washington do this very well. Write letters. I heard recently that every time a congressperson receives a letter, they take that to mean there's a thousand other people out there with the same opinion. That's pretty powerful. So if you write a letter, you're actually speaking for a thousand people. That doesn't make it seem like such a waste of time after all. And believe me, 50 people write a letter on an issue. That congressperson is going to stand up and say, hey, somebody get on this. You get 100 people to write a letter, and that congressperson is going to make sure that they know what's going on about this issue, because they are elected by us. They need to know about the issues. We elected them. We need to hold them responsible. We need to hold places like the World Bank accountable. And we can, because it's our money, up to a certain degree. And finally, my friend was out in the Northwest uh, last summer, and he brought me back a couple of presents. This is uh, the Northwest Temperate Forest, and they don't, they don't look too good. Once again, I go back to the point, if we can't take care of our own home, what right do we have to tell others what to do with theirs? The United States has a lot of great forests, and because it's temperate forest, it'll grow back. However, we need to put pressure on those people who manage our own forest system, because even more directly, we feel the effects here at home. Now, I think this is an interesting slide. One of our staff people just came back from Brazil, and she brought this. And in the forefront, it's beautiful, lush, flowery, tropical forest. And in the back, for literally, probably hundreds of miles, it's all deforested. Which is the future and which is the past? These are the words, key words of the Rainforest Alliance. Interdependence and responsibility. We are interdependent, I hope to show, with tropical forests. We get products from them. It's important for us to be stewards, to be responsible for safeguarding their future. Interdependence and responsibility. We cannot continue to just get and take and take and take. We cannot just think that we have to get something for conservation. You get a lot of direct mail probably from organizations in the mail wanting your money. Why are there so many organizations? Why are they wasting all this paper? Why don't they just get together? Because the problems are so big. We are doing an enormous disservice to our environment. And there needs to be a lot of organizations out there working on its behalf. And I mentioned direct mail. You know, everybody was sort of getting down on direct mail again. This is just a, although we don't really do direct mail. Direct mail takes up some paper, but uh, it comes to your house, in your privacy of your own home, you can look at it, if you don't want to read it, you can throw it away. Direct mail does not call you up on the phone, direct mail does not visit you at your office or at your classroom. 
We have to somehow find a way to reach you, to reach the public, to get more people involved. And if you have better ways, help us. But there is a time clock running for the future of tropical forests. And I'm afraid to say that because you've sat here this evening and listened to me, you are now spokespeople. Because you are now more educated than most about tropical forests and the future of them. So we need you. And when I say we, it's the big we. It's the reason I got involved with tropical forests in the first place. I wanted to be a spokesperson for the plants and the animals and the trees of the forest that could not speak for themselves. So I encourage you to help us speak for all of them. Can I have the lights, please? <laughs> On top of it, we do special projects. Last year we did a, a radiothon. We got a whole bunch of celebrities, everybody from, I hate to say it, Pee Wee Herman and Tony Bennett, uh, David Byrne, every major rock group with The Who, we, get them, we got them to come on radio and to talk about uh, the need to save the rainforest. There's in six seas around the country, and we did a radio thon. And we raised about uh, $400,000, and we took that money, and we went down to Costa Rica, and we did what's called a, a debt for nature swap. We bought with a local group, of course, because we would never buy land as a North American organization by itself. We bought with them about 5,000 acres of land by turning the money into local currency, thus getting it about 65 cents on the dollar. You may have heard about debt for nature swaps. They were pioneered by Dr. Thomas Lovejoy at the Smithsonian Institution, one of our board members. So we try and do these creative projects because people are getting tired of this. People are getting tired of hearing about rainforests, and we're going to always have to come up with new and exciting things to do. And once again, I encourage you, if you've got some exciting things to do, um, let us know about them. So, oh, I'm just supposed to mention, there's a new series of organizations that are growing on college campuses called the uh, Rainforest Conservancy. And they are holding a major conference in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, September, something like 28th and 29th, and they're gonna have a thousand college students from around the country getting together to try and chart a course for how college students can get involved. And I can uh, help you get in touch with those people if you wanna try and attend should be quite a party, and they're a good group of people. Um, so, without any, I guess I'll take questions or, okay, yeah. Yes, there are uh, numerous, but not enough, reforestation or afforestation campaigns that are taking place around, I know many in Central and South America. However, CARE is a big one for them. But uh, there's, there's a lot of them, but most of them are focusing on forest still standing. But there's, there, I would say one of the new waves right now is looking at what we can do with degraded lands so we don't have to cut down primary forests anymore. So it's a good question, and it is happening. Yes? Well, if I had $14 billion, is that what you're asking me? Well, um, if, I, if I had $14 billion, first thing I would try and do is I would get rid of all foreign debt in tropical countries. Because countries like Brazil, um, other South, South American countries, have such huge foreign insurmountable debts that they can barely afford to make interest payments on their the, the bad loans or their, their debts that, that, that they, they can't put any money into conservation. I would then uh, invest a lot in education in tropical countries, helping them realize the value of the forest. I would look at jobs. I would look at alternative economies. Um, there are, for example, uh, when you know in Brazil they smoke fish. You get smoked fish. They use charcoal to smoke fish. There are some people out there in Brazil who are coming up with trying to find new ways to smoke fish without using wood. There are a lot of economies out there. I would set up communal banks in local rainforest uh, or areas where people can 
use funds at their own discretion rather than having to go through big banks and big interest payments. I mean, I don't, I don't have all the answers, as I said before. There are a host of things that aren't being done now because of a lack of money. And I believe that with a big influx of money used wisely, we could take away most of the intense pressures that are facing forests. And another big one is uh, for helping to provide jobs in cities to keep people out of the forest because they're, they're unemployed and desperate looking for places to go. Yes? Um, are pharmaceutical companies concerned about rainforest as far as the medicines that come from them? Pharmaceutical companies are concerned about rainforest if they have money involved. Pharmaceutical companies are big, big money earners. And, uh, you know, we just got a nice grant from a pharmaceutical company, but I would still say that pharmaceutical companies have not done nearly enough to get involved. They have made billions of dollars. Eli Lilly has made billions of dollars from, from the uh, periwinkle. There's a, a plant, a tree that's growing wild in the rainforest called pilocarpus. And if you have glaucoma, there's a really good chance that you go to your pharmacist and he, he or she will give you pilocarpine drops. And they're straight out of a tree in the Amazon that is going extinct in the wild. And we've been sending letters to pharmaceutical companies to get $40,000 to do cultivations of this, and they're not interested. They think, for the most part, that they can synthesize everything in a laboratory. However, there are a lot of, some pharmaceutical companies are starting to go back to their roots in the rainforest, and in April, we brought together six of the major pharmaceutical companies with a lot of the conservation organizations and economists and lawyers, and we're trying to create a manual for how pharmaceutical companies can, in fact, work in the rainforest. In Brazil, they're upset. That a lot of the people I know who work in Brazil and ethnobotany do not even want to allow pharmaceutical companies in there anymore because they go in, they take their species, and they go back and they, they, they look under the microscope and they figure out the compounds of it and they try and synthesize it. And they don't need the rainforest after that. But that's not fair. And that's the whole bag of worms with intellectual property rights that we're looking at. But believe me, it's a bag of worms. Yep? Well, there was a very quick piece on uh, all things considered this afternoon about Conoco uh, proposed new road into virgin uh, rainforest there. I was wondering if you had uh, things to say about the oil industry and mm -hmm. uh, what kind of action we could take to be uh, with the big gas station. Well, I, I know a lot about this. Um, <laughs> oil, oil, oil. <laughs> oil, uh, we are very oil dependent in the United States and around the world. Conoco has been trying to, to drill in Yasuni National Park in Ecuador for several years. And when they first started, I don't know if they knew that they were in the park. But I, I, I remember, gosh, it must have been 1988, the guys from Conoco coming to our office and talking with us and showing us the brochure and saying, <laughs> Let us take you there. We're trying to do this in a responsible way. Do I believe them? I'm not sure. You know, you know, Conoco has come out and they've said they've 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 opened themselves up to the public, which I appreciate. Can't, and I, I really appreciate the fact that they're trying to do this in a responsible manner. I don't know if it's possible. We talked about road building. Um, a lot of the environmentalists are fighting with each other about this because who represents the people, the native peoples, who, re who represents the government. But we are going to see a lot more drilling for oil in tropical forests because we have taken it from all the easy places. It's going away from all the places that are easy to get to. The next place to go is the rainforest. We knew this. So in a way, I think, if Conoco is going to be a case study and be an example, let's let them show us how it's going to happen in the future. At the same time, a national park should not have oil drilling in it. So am I waffling in my answer? Yes. Because it's tough. It's, it's a real tough call. I, I really support Native peoples and their, their rights of determination. But uh, I'm, also, I'm also very concerned about what's going to happen with oil. Oil is the number one export in Ecuador. You know, we're, the Rainforest Alliance has just started a big project in 
Central America looking at bananas. Big export crop, but we're not trying to boycott them or pick at them. What we're trying to do is get the banana companies together with the conservation organizations in Costa Rica and talk about what, what can we do to set up guidelines, environmental guidelines, environmental impacts. And we've talked to that the person who started that whole mess in Ecuador, the environmentalist who wrote the book, uh, we've talked with her about how we can do the same thing in, in oil, but you mention oil in Ecuador and you get yourself kicked out of there because it's a major product. And if you start talking about, you know, you're going to pick at a gas station, uh, hypothetically, and the problem with that is um, this is 85% of Ecuador's uh, gross national product. So what are they going to do if they don't have oil? Uh, you know, unless you can come up, if you're going to pick at them, have an alternative at the same time for, in for income. I mean, I, I probably sound like I'm really conservative here, but what else are you going to do? If you don't do that, we have no solutions on our hand, and, and we are just, once again, driving ourselves down a road of disaster. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, it seems that maybe it's probably will be, because one thing that we can be uh, opposed to without uh, hesitation, the beef production in Central and South America is concentrated in a very small number of hands of uh, wealthy families, and that is not being raised on former uh, rainforest land, it's being raised on land that uh, could, has been used for producing corn and beans for uh, people who don't have land right now. Uh, do you know uh, what the effect has been of the uh, Burger King boycott and how much, how much the change has been in the amount of profit coming into this country since that boycott? Uh, I think it's cut down. I definitely think that it's cut down. Uh, people have gotten out of the business and are looking for different economies. A lot of the rain, I mean, Central America, most of the rainforest is gone. Uh, you know, really, and there are cows there. Not all of it has been cut down for cows initially. Some of it's been cut down for other forms of agriculture, but wow, there are cows everywhere. You drive along in, in Costa Rica and Panama, they're everywhere. And I agree with you, it does seem somewhat clear cut. At the same time, uh, once again, I look to alternatives. I would rather, I would rather choose for myself uh, how I want to, what I want to eat, how I want to live, and then make my political statement by trying to find a solution. The, I'm not sure if that's a solution. I think if you're going to match that, the, 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 if you're just not going to eat the beef, I wouldn't just eat the beef, but I'd write letters about it, and I'd tell people why you're doing it, and I would propose other things. But by itself, it's just not, it's not enough. And overall, I think that, I definitely think there's been an impact. The Burger King boycott raised huge amounts of awareness in the United States, and I give it a lot of credit for that. And it raised a lot of awareness in Costa Rica, and a lot of people are still unhappy about it. But it has definitely put things in motion. Boycotts will do that. Uh, boycotts will, will scare people and put things in motion. So, I mean, you know, if you're going to pick at somebody at the same thing, you know, you are going to put pressure on people, and they're not going to like it. Somebody stands outside of your house, and, and yells at how bad you are, uh, you're not going to like it either. And, and, and encourages people to find solutions, or encourages them to maybe find solutions. Oftentimes those solutions are PR oriented, and that's not enough. So you have to, you have to really, somebody's got to be cutting in there, working with these companies and, and, and showing that they're not completely afraid of them, that their companies are not necessarily inherently bad, it's just that they need to work on finding better ways to use the land. Yes? Uh, the Rainforest Alliance mission statement is to find alternatives to deforestation that are both economically viable and socially desirable. We look for areas that we can, in fact, develop solutions um, that are product related. And we try and look at things that are North American related. You'll probably see us getting involved in oil. We're getting involved in bananas. We're getting involved in fish. Uh, we're looking at gold mining. We're involved in medicinal plants. We're involved in rattan. So we choose our products by looking at how we can uh, change the way a product comes out of the forest. I still don't know a product that comes out of the forest, marketed internationally, that is good for it. And Last week, I was talking with a friend of mine who's an anthropologist who's a specialist in products in the forest, and we are, we are sort of complaining that there are 
some organizations come out and they've got these really glossy brochures with their slick strategies on how they're going to save the rainforest and how we didn't buy into that at all. How we didn't think that there was, uh, we don't think that there's a single strategy, that the problems are all different. And, and so my the person who answers the phone says, Dan, you got to take this call. There's a guy on the other line who is uh, trying to declare the beneficiary of his insurance policy and he wants to talk to you. And I said, I got to go. So I, I talked to this guy and, and about five minutes in the conversation he said, so tell me about your grant strategy. I've read this group's and that group's. And I'm thinking, hmm, insurance policy? And he's telling me this is you know, several hundred thousand dollars. And I, I had to tell him, we don't have a single strategy. There is no single solution to deforestation. There are things that we can do, but it's just not as uh, neatly packaged as I'd like it to be. I still think he's going to make that beneficiary out of us. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. No, no, because I, I, I said internationally. Uh, our medicinal plants project, we support model medicinal plant gardens that are for use locally or regionally. I, I would just say that we should not, we've been getting benefits from tropical forests for hundreds and thousands of years. We shouldn't think that for us to save the rainforest now, we have to get something in return. We tend to look, we're in the United States, we're in New York. So we tend to look at projects uh, that that affect North Americans that we can see a clear connection to. But by all means, I mean, by, by no way is there this the only thing. There are lots of organizations out there. The Rainforest Alliance, historically speaking, um, you know, we're small. We started in 1986. Now we have about, uh, we have 20 some odd people and some fellows and an office in Costa Rica, but we're not a big organization. So we have to choose our projects carefully. And, you know, that's, that's how we elect to choose them because we see real connections there and we see real ways that we can make an impact on conservation. And all the organizations together are going to have to do the big thing. Well, is there any last question? Yeah. You claim that 50% of the all the time last year for my farm was there. You didn't clarify the amount that was done by cattle and the dam. Can you talk about that a little bit? Is this about the one by the United States? How much of an impact do we have in 30% of the voters in the bank? What is this something that the United States citizens can do? And two, is this something that we should even attempt to with this type of good local journalism between people in Brazil, people outside of Europe? Well, we're not at war with those people. It's not really a battle to win. It's a. We are looking for. The, the, the planet is much smaller now. You know, you can, we have a, we can fax Nowheresville in the upper regions in Peru. You can get a fax back in a matter of seconds. The world is a small place. We all share the planet. And our goal is to look at ways, internationally, we, look at ways that we can all do develop, development in a better in a better fashion. We're not going to try and uh, tell people not to have their TV. And slash and burn agriculture is going to happen as long as there are no other alternatives in certain ways, or if there's if we don't have as many people in the rainforest, slash and burn agriculture is okay. It was for, for hundreds of years. Tr saving tropical forests is definitely going to be everybody's role. Um, but I, you know, I sort of got a little sidetracked when I heard about the at the. United States winning the battle because I get all of a sudden these visions of tanks going in, and you know, and people often ask me, why can't we just spend little people? And they say, why can't we just put these people in jail? Why can't we just lock them up? We have to respect sovereign rights, and while we we try and work on an international issue, um, it's it's tough. I'm not sure if I answered the last part or the part of your question. So did I get that? Well, the only problem with that is, I mean, with taking some time for 
First, I guess, assuming that sovereign rights are the most important, is this even something that is the best for the United States citizens to try to solve the really possible harm that might happen to the United States citizens? Well, I think that it's not just the United States citizens. No, no. We're going to cause more harm by not doing anything. Well, that's not true. We've caused a lot of harm by not doing anything already. We've caused a lot of harm by, by living our lifestyles. If we don't look at our own lifestyles, uh, we're going to continue to cause harm for Costa Ricans, for everybody else. We definitely need to look at how we live and then how we can get involved. And I must say, I hate to say it, but one of the best ways to do it is to, to support financially other people to do it. Because we're busy. We've got our own things going on, our own happy lifestyles. And writing a check seems to be one easy way. And that's time, you know, times are tough, but we, we're finding now that people, I buy bottled water in New York. Water is no longer free. Clean water is no longer free. Clean air is being sold off as by, companies are starting to buy that as pollution rights. So we're involved. It's become economic and we are involved in the economic situation. So, um, Thanks for coming out this evening, and if you want to get if you want to get more involved, uh, you can talk with me, or I can send information, and some literature is also coming. Thanks. <laughs>